Well, it's, it's wonderful to be with everyone, and, and it's an honor and privilege to be with you. And I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Balajit and Reasons to Believe uh, for inviting me today. And <clears throat> it's, it's an honor to be with you, and, and uh, my prayer is that we glorify Christ with our discussion today. Um, save your answer, answer or your questions till the end, and I'll uh, stay as long as we're able to answer any questions that you may have. We're going to talk about the crucifixion of Jesus, medical perspectives. The agenda is that uh, <clears throat> we're going to talk about the events from Jesus' arrest to his crucifixion, sweating blood. We're going to talk about Roman crucifixion practices, the cause of Jesus' death, uh, which is uh, the focus will be traumatic hemorrhagic shock, which is how I believe Jesus died and has, has become a preponderance of medical opinion uh, in recent writing. Then we're going to talk about the importance of the blood of Jesus, uh, which is really the should be the focus of our our thoughts on Good Friday as as it approaches us. <clears throat> the passion passion is an old English word which means suffering, and the passion of Jesus uh, is the is the events from his arrest to his uh, crucifixion. Uh, Jesus uh, went to the garden to pray after the Passover meal probably about 9 p.m. until midnight, and then he's arrested. He was taken to the home of Annas, who was the father-in-law of Joseph Caiaphas, the high priest at the time. They lived in a multi-generational mansion. This is where Jesus was tried and beaten. Then he is sent to Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate wanted to deflect the situation. He understood the motivation of, of the Jewish leadership. So he sent Jesus to Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas was the son of Herod the Great. And when Herod the Great died, his kingdom was divided among his uh, children. So he was the uh, king of Judea at that time, uh, a client kingdom of the Roman Empire. Herod Antipas put a robe on Jesus and sent him back to Pilate. At this point, the whole company of soldiers, according to Matthew, uh, caned and beat Jesus. Then he was led away to a crucifixion, which involved uh, scourging and then nailed to the cross. According to the biblical accounts, Jesus was on the cross at 9 a.m. According to Mark, noon, according to John, the synoptic gospels, that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, state the time of death was uh, 3 p.m. John does not state the time of death. When Jesus went to the garden to pray, he was in an extreme state of emotional duress. In Matthew, it, it quotes Jesus to say, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. And so Jesus had seen crucifixion. It was common as a, as a focus of deterrence by the uh, Roman authorities, but also with Jesus, of course, he's about to bear the sins of humanity. So the duress was overwhelming. Uh, this is where it's said that he sweat uh, blood, and this is recorded in Luke chapter 22. Uh, being in agony, he was praying uh, fervently with sweat came like uh, drops of blood falling down to the ground. And I've heard people question whether this is even a valid description or was it added sometime later? Is, is it a valid part of the Gospels? The, the answer to that is that this really happens. Uh, and Luke, as a physician, must have known about it and thought it would be a significant detail to add to, to the Gospels. The, the medical word is hematidrosis. It means sweating blood. But it's so rare that there are very few cases that, that have been able to be studied medically. The largest review of case reports is in the Journal of Internal Medicine by Holabeck, where they reviewed 76 cases. The The type of uh, hematidrosis that Jesus experienced was the rarest form, that is, single episode, psychogenic uh, hematidrosis, and there are only just a handful of cases of that, and it it, it almost always occurred before execution, uh, or it, it at the threat of, of severe bodily harm. And the descriptions are variable, it can be associated with edema or swelling, uh, blood can be expressible from the skin. The skin can become hypersensitive. This is a case that was published by the Canadian Medical Association. 
uh, of a young lady who had recurrence. Now, this is multiple episodes of hematidrosis, and you can see the, the photograph there. Uh, she was admitted to the hospital, had uh, extensive evaluation, all of her blood indices were normal. And you see next to the face there a biopsy slide, which was normal. So they could not identify what was happening to this young lady or what, how it was occurring. Uh, the treatment they gave her was propanolol, which is a medication that's used for anxiety, and it caused her symptoms to subside. And so, in a way, you could say hematidrosis is, is a uh, medical mystery, and a mystery only because we just don't have cases to study to really understand how this occurs to people. It's just too rare, uh, but it, it does occur, and so we must accept Luke's description as a valid one. Uh, Jesus at the home of Annas and Caiaphas was uh, uh, convicted of blasphemy, which was punishable by death. Uh, in, in Hebrew law. Uh, the problem for them was that uh, by this time, uh, the, the Jewish kingdom had lost capital authority. They could not execute anyone. Here it's where they asked Jesus if he's the Messiah, and he says to them, you will see me sitting next to the right hand of God and coming in cl uh, clouds. And so these are very, this is from Psalm 110, a, a messianic prophecy. Uh, everyone understood exactly what he said, and they convicted him to death at that point. The problem was they had to conscript the Roman government to, to do the execution. But they had uh, authority for corporal punishment, so it's here that they beat him. And they put a, uh, a blanket or something on, on him and hit him, struck him, say, and said, prophesy to us, tell us who's hitting you. Now, this is of medical importance because here we see injuries starting to occur that set up a cascade of events uh, that ultimately lead to Jesus' rapid death. So this is a, a beating that uh, could they have killed him? They would have, but they, they just beat him and then uh, took him to uh, Pilate. Here we see a map of, of Jesus' pathway that night. He's arrested in the garden. Then he's taken to the palace of the high priest. Again, this is a multi-generational mansion uh, where Annas and Caiaphas uh, and their families lived. He's beaten there with a secret trial. Then he's sent to uh, Pilate. Pilate wants to deflect the situation. He sends him to uh, Herod Antipas. Now, you know, Pilate lived in Caesarea, a beach community. That was the seat of Roman government. But they were in Jerusalem during the Passover week as a show of military force. And so Herod Antipas sees Jesus. He doesn't really do anything, puts a robe on him, and sends him back to Pilate. Now, this is where Jesus, again, is beaten by a company of soldiers. You understand that the Roman government, uh, they were anti-Semitic, they hated Jewish people, and here there's a person being convicted of political as a political insurgent, saying he's the king of the Jews in defiance of, of Caesar. After this, Jesus is, is scourged and beaten and led away to the crucifixion site. The execution site is, is uh, there's disagreement about what the precise place. So Jesus walked approximately uh, 3.5 uh, kilometers that night. Briefly about the, the crown of thorns, uh, you know, crowns were common in uh, the Roman uh, culture, and the crown of grass was the highest honor that anyone could receive it from in the Roman government, and it would be awarded to someone by unanimous vote of the army if the general had, by bravery and intelligence, uh, led the the, uh, the army from destruction and on to victory. And how they would make the crown of grass would be they would take plant material from the area they had conquered and make a crown out of it for their general. And so I believe, and it's not only I, but others believe that that uh, they were mocking Jesus here as if he had conquered the Roman uh, government, the Roman army. Um, so you can understand the hatred and the the uh, vigorous beating he would have received from the Roman soldiers. You know, the Jews could give 39 stripes to someone. The Romans didn't have a limit. They just 
should not have killed the person before they got to the crucifixion site. Uh, here's a verse from Isaiah. It says, uh, I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. I'll talk to you about Roman crucifixion and what that was like. Uh, Quintilian was a first century uh, Roman, uh, and uh, he's not a Christian. Uh, this is what he said, whenever we crucify the condemned, the most crowded roads are chosen, where the most people can see and be moved by this terror. The penalties relate not so much to the retribution as to their exemplary effect. They believed in uh, capital punishment as a deterrent, and uh, they put it was on full display for everyone. So Jesus, everyone living in that time, would have seen crucifixion. Uh, Roman crucifixion uh, was adopted in approximately 300 BC. It did not extend beyond the reign of Constantine in about 341 AD. So that's six centuries. The Romans would have crucified thousands of people, maybe hundreds of thousands. It's hard to say. You know, with the Spartacus Rebellion at 70 BC, they they crucified 6,000 people on the Appian Way to 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 crush that rebellion. So it was something common and something they used vigorously. There would be an execution team that completed the the crucifixion, uh, often of uh, a quaterno of four soldiers that was uh, directed by an exactor mortis, the centurion, who oversaw the process. And we see this alluded to in Mark chapter 15, 45, where Pilate uh, seeks the uh, uh, verification from the centurion that, that Jesus had actually died because it, Jesus died rapidly. And I'll, I'll talk about that in detail later. Um, crucifixion could last for days. So Pilate was surprised and he needed to verify the death of Jesus before he released his body to Joseph of Arimathea. The crucarius, that's condemned person, was scourged. Then they would carry the patibulum, that's the horizontal section of the cross, maybe uh, 30 kilograms, to the execution site. Uh, crucifixion, again, occurred in a conspicuous location just outside the city. The condemned person was scourged all over their body. There were multiple soldiers that participated in that. They would use a flagrum which had leather strips with lead balls sewn into the end and uh, again scourged all over the body. Uh, Eusebius uh, was the uh, bishop of Caesarea, which again was the seat of Roman government in Judea. He lived during the crucifixion time, so he had seen crucifixions. He wrote this description for us. Bystanders were struck with amazement when they saw them lacerated with scourges even to the innermost veins and arteries, so the hidden inward parts of their body, both their bowels and their members, were exposed to view. So you can you can understand how the lashes were, were ripping the flesh. Uh, the person again would carry the horizontal section of the cross. They, they would walk naked through the streets carrying the Titillus Crucis, which uh, was a plaque that uh, stated the crimes for which they were being executed. It would be in the lo local language, the uh, judici ju judicial language of Latin, and then the common language of Koine Greek. Uh, the, the cross itself in Jesus' time and most commonly would be what's called a Tau cross, which would be in the, the shape of the English capital T, which you see here. And the condemned person would be nailed with their arms to the horizontal section, then lifted by the soldiers and placed on top of the uh, vertical section called the stipes, and it would be coupled by a mortise and tenon coupling. So um, <clears throat> you can understand that the person hanging on the cross would be just about at eye level with the executioners. In this picture, it shows a set aisle, which is a seat. There are some literary references to that. It's unlikely that it was common, though, just to the carpentry demands of doing that to the crosses when it really didn't serve any purpose. It, it, believe me, they were not interested in the comfort of the individual. Here's a verse from Isaiah. It said, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and with his wounds we are healed. 
there are different types of crosses. The crux, crux simplex is a stake. And yes, the Romans did su- impale people and suspend them on stakes. In fact, uh, Nero is said to have lighted his uh, gardens in the evening by burning the bodies of Christians on, on a stake, so-called Roman candle. Then you have um, the crops, uh, uh, emissa, which is kind of what we think commonly in, in artwork and so forth. But again, the carpentry demands of producing that kind of thing made it uh, less common. The most common type of cross was the cross commissa, or what's called the tau or T cross, which is what I described to you uh, a moment ago uh, with a mortise and tenon coupling <clears throat> that uh, fix the uh, horizontal uh, section. Then uh, there's the uh, St. Andrew's cross, which you see, but uh, there's disagreement about whether that type of cross was used in that time. This is the first known depiction of anyone that was crucified. It's the crucifixion of Al Camilla, which is a female, which is odd because, uh, or unusual, because uh, Roman citizens and females were were generally not crucified. Crucifixion was for political insurgents, runaway slaves, and egregious criminals. Um, And this is very early. This dates to the uh, period of Trajan and Hadrian, or the late first or early second century. And please notice the shape of the cross is in in a a tau cross. It's a T-shaped cross. And you can see the depiction of the scourge marks and the name above the uh, shoulder on the right inscribed. This is another early uh, description uh, or depiction of crucifixion. It's called the graffito blasphemer, the blasphemous graffiti, which uh, the inscription states, Alexa Menos adores his God. <clears throat> and it was common in ancient Rome to ridicule the Christian God as a human with features of a donkey. And you see that depicted here in this caricature. Again, please notice that the shape of the cross is the shape of a T. This dates to the very early 2nd century. I think 202 is the date that I remember. You can The crucifixion nails have been found, so you can get an image of what the, uh, what the size of that would be. This is an interesting study that was done by, you know, doctors are strange people. Uh, Pierre Barbet, uh, the French surgeon, he uh, he had to at times amputate uh, people's arms, and so he uh, took and did a study of twelve uh, arms where he uh, drove a nail through their wrist, and and he was testing to see how much force it would take for it to pull the hand out, and with a nail through the center of the hand, which is what you see in a lot of artwork, the nail would pull out with 100 pounds of force. That wouldn't hold to someone on the cross. But if you bend your ring finger down to the base of the vertical wrist crease and drove a nail through there, that would create a stable fixation to 245 pounds of distraction. That would hold somebody on the cross and be stable. And that's what this uh, x-ray slide shows. And he did this on 12 specimens. They all went through the wrist bones without fracturing them. And so this would be likely how the nails would have been placed. This uh, artistic illustration I want you to notice shows that the circulation of the hand, the arteries going into the hand are, would be undisturbed by the nail. So this the individual would not have lost a lot of blood from the nail being placed this way. Uh, the artist also depicts that the median nerve is in the pathway of the nail. Now that's that would be that's significant because that's the nerve that's uh, can be pinched with carpal tunnel syndrome. If you drive a nail through that and, and macerate or cut the nerve in half, it would send like lightning pain up your arm. It would be horrible. And then the hand would go flaccid at that point. Uh, Josephus was a, a Jewish person, but he defected and became a Roman. He Romanized his name to Flavius Josephus. And he was an eyewitness to the siege of Jerusalem where he said they crucified up to 500 people a day. Uh, he said they had trouble finding enough wood to make the crosses. 
and this is his description. They were first whipped and then tormented with all sorts of tortures before they died, and they were crucified before the wall of the city. The soldiers, out of wrath and hatred they bore for the Jews, nailed those they caught to the crosses in different postures by way of jest. Uh, archaeology, you know, it, it may surprise you if the Romans crucified so many people, why, why we have just a handful of archaeological finds of, of these things. And the reason is that uh, when people were crucified, their remains were left on the cross to be eaten by scavenging animals. And so we don't have a lot of them, but we do have a handful, a few. Uh, and we'll look at the the interesting one, I think, is uh, from Jerusalem from the first century, where in an ossuary, a bone box, uh, they found this, and this is what it looked like. They couldn't really tell exactly what it was, but they could see there was a nail through a bone there. And then after they cleaned it up, they could see that it was the heel, that the nail had been driven sideways through the calcaneus or the heel bone. And there were uh, fragments of wood next to the nail head, so they could see that this was how that that person's foot was nailed to the cross. And you can see that the wood there would, in effect, enlarge the head of the nail so you couldn't pry it off. This is um, the uh, the left uh, heel bone of that same individual where you can see the uh, that the nail had been removed. And they would harvest the nails and reuse them. Uh, or sometimes people with in the dark magic uh, trades would would uh, take the nails and do various incantations. Um, it's curious. I'll point out. You know, how do you think they got the body down if the foot was stuck to the cross in a bent nail? Um, they amputated the foot. They there are cut marks on the tailless part of the ankle, so they they cut the foot off, took the body down, and then pried the foot off. Apparently. This is a find in uh, England, uh, in uh, Cambridgeshire, which is uh, a little north of uh, London, where again you see the uh, the nail through the calcaneus, the heel bone. That individual also had fractured ribs, his so legs were not fractured. And again, another view of the nail through the heel of that individual. Now, <clears throat> in most artwork, we see the nails through the top of the feet, and um, and th th that just never happened. This is artistic invention. And I would point out that uh, crucifixes, any kind of uh, artwork venerating Jesus did not exist until the sixth century. So anybody that painted a reverent picture of Jesus never saw crucifixion. So this is a pure artistic uh, invention. Of all the artwork I've seen, this is the one that I think is most uh, accurate. And this is by Nicholas Gay in the uh, late 19th century, where you can see what probably approximates what crucifixion would look like, uh, except the body would be scourged and beaten all over in a way that would be hideous to look at. You know, in Isaiah, it says, we hid our faces from him. He was, it was probably horrible to look at. And we can assume that easily. Uh, this brings to mind what's called the Proto-Evangelium, the first gospel, Genesis 3.15, where God speaks to Satan in, in the serpent. He says, I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. Psalm 22 is very unusual a prophetic psalm, it's attributed to David 700 years before Christ, and it says this, a pack of villains encircles me, they pierce my hands and my feet, all my bones are on display, people stare and gloat over me. Now, some people, scholars, had questioned whether, I mean, this is just too Christian, it describes uh, crucifixion, and w was this verse altered in some way? Uh, but it wasn't, because this was found among the Dead Sea Scrolls that predates the time of Christ. This is exactly how it was written by David. And it's interesting because that even predates uh, the use of, of crucifixion. So this is a very, very interesting and, and prophetic sort of scripture. In fact, uh, Justin Martyr, 
used this particular verse in his uh, apology. Apology means to give an answer for our faith. Uh, in in to uh, the emperor Antonius Pius to say it was prophesied hundreds of years before that Jesus would be executed by foreigners, that the Messiah would be executed by foreigners, because the Jews never used crucifixion as a form of, of capital punishment. So it's a very profound verse. Uh, moving on to Jesus' cause of death, Jesus' cause of death was crucifixion. and But medically speaking, when we talk about the cause of death, what we're really talking about is the mechanism of death, what happened physiologically that led to the cessation of life. And I want to talk briefly about uh, suffocation, because that's what we hear. This has become a common uh, description of how Jesus died, and, and it's erroneous, uh, and I, I want to explain why. Anyway, but suffocation is the interruption of the respiratory apparatus, where asphyxiation is the effect of oxygen deprivation. So you understand suffocation can lead to asphyxiation. Uh, this is really a new idea, new meaning in the past hundred years. It was first proposed by a French surgeon named Lebec and a Czechoslovakian surgeon named Hynek. They were aware of suspension torture in the uh, Austro-Hungarian War uh, in World War I, and that it was also part of the Nazi penal code and used in Nazi concentration camps. And what would happen was that the individual would have their arms suspended directly overhead with uh, their feet unsupported, and sometimes they'd put weights on the feet. And uh, this, you know, uh, and very uncomfortable. And the um, Dr. Barbet in his book, A Doctor at Calvary, in Appendix 1, records an eyewitness account that was told to him about somebody that was tortured with suspension torture to the point that it killed them. And the death occurred in about three hours. And the description is fairly clear that the, the individual suffocated. And so Dr. Barbet thought, well, that, that must be the mechanism of death for crucifixion. Um, in yeah. fairness to Dr. Barbet in appendix number two, he puts the uh, opinion of a colleague named Dr. Smith who disagreed with him. But the idea that Jesus suffocated became uh, kind of a folklore that uh, it gets preached about probably every Easter you're going to hear how Jesus suffocated. Um, but again, it's, it's a new idea, and it's based on a flawed analogy. And I'll show you. Um, uh, this is a painting. The artist Jan Komsky uh, was interred at three concentration camps during World War uh, II. He survived and afterwards painted pictures of the things that occurred there. And he was tortured an hour a day for three days for bringing food back to the concentration camp. And uh, that's, that's his depiction of that. Now, here's the idea. The, uh, the muscles that insert on the chest wall, the serratus anterior muscle, also uh, insert on the scapula, the shoulder blade. So you can understand that if you pull on the shoulder blade and the arm, that it could expand the chest wall and restrict respiration. And then it would flatten the diaphragm. The diaphragm is the flat muscle that separates the chest from the abdominal contents. And so if you and that accounts for about 60% of respiration. So if you if you restrict the movement, it will uh, you know, restrict the ability to breathe and in effect cause uh, suffocation. And so this is from Dachau, the, the concentration camp, where the report that Dr. Barbet records occurred. So you can you can understand how horrible this would be that the arms were twisted behind the back so that the shoulder blades were rotated clockwise and with an external force pulling them away from the chest that you could not have a worse position to extra put an extraction force on the chest wall. And in Dr. Barbet's example in appendix one of his book, that led to that individual's death. So this kind of torture could be prolonged to murder. And I, I just want to stop and, and ask you, 
I think we all can see that this is not crucifixion. Crucifixion had the arms to the side and the feet were supported. And crucifixion could also last for days. There are literary references up to a week. So uh, if someone in this position tortured this way would not survive beyond three hours. Now, again, doctors are strange people. This is uh, uh, Dr. Zugaby, and he did reenactment ex experiments, and this is his son. So I, I keep telling my son I plan to repeat this experiment. But um, what he did was he suspended people on, on a cross uh, subjects, one of them being his own child, but he monitored them, uh, their vital signs, even their blood gases. Uh, they were very uncomfortable. They could not pull themselves up, as some postulate was they were doing on the cross. They could not pull themselves with, up on the, with their arms or push themselves up with their legs in this position. But they didn't have trouble breathing, talking, and their their gas blood gases uh, you know, remained uh, within normal limits. What do eyewitnesses tell us? There were people that saw crucifixion. What do they say? Again, Eusebius, the bishop of uh, Caesarea, saw crucifixions. He said, others again were crucified, some as malefactors usually are, and some even more brutally were nailed in the opposite manner, head downwards, and kept alive until they should perish of hunger. Eusebius thought they died of deprivation. Philo of Alexandria, first century Jewish philosopher, for death follows the scarcity of food. And the one who did wrong in these matters appropriately dies by being suspended, suffering the same evil that he arranged because he suspended and tortured the starved man with the hunger. So those two fellows that saw crucifixion uh, thought people died of deprivation. And what is conspicuously absent from eyewitness accounts of crucifixion is any idea, any nuance that anyone had trouble breathing. What about talking from the cross? Jesus talked to John and his mother talk to the other felons that were being uh, crucified. You know, uh, I would just point out, I, I've never seen anyone suffocate, but I've seen people dying of pulmonary death. And they're not interested in casual conversation. They're struggling to take the last breath of life. Seneca the Younger, a Roman, he said, but... Uh, these others who bring upon themselves their own punishment are stretched upon as many crosses as they had desires, yet they are uh, slanderous and witty and heaping insult on others. I might believe that they were free to do so, did not some of them spit on spectators from their own cross. Here they are insulting people and spitting on them and talking to them. It doesn't sound like they're suffocating or dying a pulmonary death. Uh, Peter was crucified in Rome during Nero's uh, persecution in AD 64. It's traditionally held that he was crucified upside down, feeling unworthy to be crucified the same position as Jesus. He preached to his executioners until he died. So there is really not ancient literary support to say that people had any trouble breathing. Again, this is a modern sort of invention. Um, I'll, I'll speak briefly on fracturing the legs. The the remains in Jerusalem did have the legs fractured. The others did not. And so here you see what's called a spiral fracture. It spirals through the bone. You can see that that's a high force fracture. When the Romans would approach someone and want to fracture their legs, you can understand that they would want to produce a compound fracture. In other words, the bones protruding through the skin. And uh, Dr. Barbet I thought, well, maybe that you know, hasten their suffocation, but uh, I, I would say that's an a priori conclusion on his part, uh, because you can understand that if someone has an acute fracture like that, they can drop 500 to 1,000 cc's or liter of blood in, in, in a few seconds by that kind of an injury. And so you can understand if someone is teetering on the point of dying anyway, and they, they take a, a hit like that and, and drop 
uh, a re fair amount of blood, it could push them over the dead and the, over the edge and kill them, uh, because <clears throat> the, the human has about five liters of blood. If you lose about 10% of that, you can start to proceed into shock. If you lose 40% of your blood volume, your blood pressure goes to zero. So if someone's on the point of dying and you take 500 or 1,000 cc's of blood from them quickly, it will push them over the edge. This is the other leg that has a transverse uh, fracture through the uh, ankle bones, the uh, uh, tibia and fibula. I'll talk about the spear wound because that's that's interesting and something that's been a, a, maybe a point of confusion. Um, coming to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead, and I would, you know, I've had to pronounce people dead, and uh, uh, you know it, it, it. But you don't have to be a physician to do that, and I would submit to you that the Roman centurion had credible authority to be able to do that. Uh, but when they saw that he was dead, they didn't break his legs, but one of the soldiers pierced his side, and uh, there came uh, immediately blood and water. Now, I, I would suggest to you that this was not a coup de grace. It was not the blow, blow of grace. They were not trying to be kind and hastened his suffering. Uh, they were going to release the body, and... They were not going to allow a, a convicted felon, someone who was condemned to crucifixion, to survive. If they released the body and he was nursed back to health, they would be killed. The soldiers, I mean. Roman military discipline was austere and severe. If you were on watch and fell asleep, they would beat you to death. If you were on a crucifixion team and you allowed someone to escape, uh, you would be killed. But some people have looked at this and wondered, this is a very curious description, water and blood, how did that happen? And some have said, well, you know, maybe Jesus was alive then because, you know, blood doesn't flow from a dead body, does it? Oh, but it can. In fact, blood can be unstable, it can, it can uh, uh, coagulate and, and uh, liquefy, uh, particularly in the case where you're having a shock occurring. But how? what about water? How did that occur? Well, water can, uh, or fluid, can develop around the, in the chest cavity, around the lungs. It's called a pleural effusion, and it can occur by blunt trauma to the chest. And that fluid is clear unless there's penetrating trauma. And so that would look like water. And then, you know, it, once there was the penetration of the heart, it would mix and look like blood. But Origen, the church father, he thought this was a miraculous sign because it's it's such a curious description. Here you can see a, a CAT scan of a pleural effusion. This is someone uh, laying on their back, so the fluid is, is in the back. It's uh, on the left side of your screen, the right side of their body. The dark areas of the lungs, you can see the heart and the, uh, but the fluid, uh, they're settled with gravity. But someone that is upright in being crucified, you can understand that the fluid is going to collect in the lower front part of the chest. So when the spear enters the chest wall, it will first encounter pl what the pleural effusion, which would be clear and look like water. Once the heart is ruptured, blood would mix with it, and then it would look like blood instead of, of water. So that we can easily understand medically this description of water and blood. This is a quote from the Journal of the Medical, American Medical Association, the Edwards article in 1985. Dr. Edwards said the important feature may not be how he died, but rather whether he died. Clearly, the weight of historical evidence, medical evidence, indicates that Jesus was dead before the wound to his side was inflicted. The interpretations based on the assumption that Jesus did not die on the cross appear to be at odds with modern medical knowledge. Jesus died by traumatic hemorrhagic shock, and the 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 word says everything. Trauma means injury, hemorrhage means bleeding, shock means an imbalance of uh, uh, oxygen demand and delivery. Essentially, the, uh, decreased blood flow to uh, uh, the organ tissue. We have clues in the scriptures that the shock was occurring. Uh, 
Jesus was in extreme emotional duress when he's shedding blood, he, sweating blood. He he would not have lost a lot of blood that way, but it says something about his emo, emotional demeanor. He would have been a high state of anxiety, sweating. He would have been deprived of uh, food and water. Uh, he would have had blood loss with the crown of thorns and then multiple beatings, again, three. This was unusual and more than what the usual crucifixion victim would endure. He was beaten at the home of the high priest, then by a company of soldiers, then led away to crucifixion, which would include scourging and crucifixion. Um, he appears to have developed a pleural effusion, so the bodily fluid be, would be diverted and collecting around the lungs, so then it means it's, 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 there's a reduction of circulating blood volume because of that. Um, so by the time he appears to have been weak and fainting by the time he's supposed to walk to the execution site, so Simon of uh, Cyrene uh, was recruited to carry the patibulum for him. No Roman was going to carry it. You understand? And Jesus cried out in thirst, and that's an important thing to notice also. Thirst during shock is different than the thirst you and I experience. The body has a very uh, elegant way of regulating our, our uh, hydration. If, if you get uh, two or three percent of, of dehydrated, you're going to feel thirsty, you're going to drink a glass of water, you're going to feel better in a few minutes, and, and that's the end of what we usually experience. But uh, when thirst is experienced in shock, it's, it's very different. It's because there's decreased circulating blood volume. And what ha you have pressure sensors in your arteries, they're called baroreceptors, and they will start stimulating the, the thirst centers in the brain to say that there's not enough blood volume. So you've got, you've got to get some water right away. And then you have a second system in your body through the kidneys, a hormonal system called the renoangiotensin system that would be stimulating the brain also by a hormone mechanism. So you have two physiological mechanisms stimulating the brain saying you, you don't have enough blood volume. You, you have to get some, some more water. You need fluid. And what happens here, it, 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 uh, it's a maddening type of, of thirst where people start hallucinating uh, images of water and that sort of thing. So it's, it's a very different sort of thirst. It's a, it's a suffering that I think we overlook when we think about the passion of Christ. And we see this verse in John chapter 19, Jesus knowing that everything was now accomplished, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. He said, I thirst. What scriptures are he, is he talking about? He's talking again about Psalm 22. My strength has dried up like sun-baked clay. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. They've laid me in the dust and left me for dead. So the shock, the thirst that he experienced was not regular, normal thirst. It was a maddening uh, kind of insanity. Uh, Dr. Zugby in his book, uh, The Crucifixion of Jesus, a Forensic Inquiry, states the cause of death this way. Uh, the cause of death is cardiac and respiratory arrest due to hypovolemic and traumatic shock due to crucifixion. I think that's exactly correct. Um, <clears throat> after I finished the draft of my medical journal article, I read this verse. And it said, this is where Jesus at the Last Supper takes the cup of wine, the, the the cup of redemption, and he says, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And I thought, oh, it, it just occurred to me, it's in a flash, that Jesus told us his cause of death. I, I wish I'd have been a little bit smarter. <laughs> it took me two years to write the medical journal article, and Jesus told us straight away in in, in at the Last Supper, he said, my blood is poured out. He, he told us that he was going to die by exsanguination, by blood loss. And that the crucifixion and the shedding of his blood inaugurated a new covenant, a new relationship. He redefined the relationship between God and humans. And I quote from uh, Hebrews chapter nine. You, so we come to this and we say, "Well, Jesus, we're talking about you know we esteemed him stricken and, and afflicted of God, and we've been talking about his suffering, but but he was wounded for our transgressions." So there's a there's a replacement, a vicarious atonement. Why did he have to die? What? Why did why did it take his death to 
bring us forgiveness. Um, in, in the law of God, in the Old Testament, it required a sacrifice for forgiveness of sins. God is just and requires sacrifice for forgiveness. And But in Hebrews 9, it says, for the sprinkling ceremonially unclean persons with the blood of goats and bulls and ashes of a heifer restored our purity, then how much more the blood of the Messiah, who through the eternal spirit offered himself to God as a sacrifice without blemish, will purify our conscience from works that lead to death so that we can serve the living God. So here we have Jesus is redefining our relationship with God, and it's creating a spiritual transformation that uh, is described in uh, you know different ways in the Bible. The you know a conversion or uh, being born again or being becoming a new creation. But the transition that occurs to a Christian when they come to faith is a spiritual one that is described here. It it is because the death uh, that he is the mediator of a new covenant or will because a death has occurred which sets people free from the transgressions committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So the, the significance of God's redefining our relationship with him, with the new covenant, is, is really what we're looking at in, with Good Friday, and we're looking at the significance of the shed blood of Jesus. I want to... Uh, quote this verse from uh, Hebrews chapter 10. This is, this is uh, I think this is profound. I, I guess I never thought until I was studying it recently. Uh, I didn't realize, I think, what the full impact is. <clears throat> Sacrifice and offerings you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. Uh, Jesus speaking to God the Father here. All burnt offerings and sin offerings you took no delight in. Then I said, here I am, I have come. It is written of me in the scroll of the book to do your will, O God. When he says, sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor did you take delight in them, which were offered according to the law, then he says, here I am, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first, or the old covenant, to establish the second. And by his will we have been made holy through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. There's two things I want you to see here. In God's domain, where which is beyond time and space in the way that we understand our lives and existence, Jesus was crucified before creation. In Hebrews 13, or Revelation 13, 8, it said he's the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. So what you have here, where you're looking at uh, a profound insight into a conversation between God the Father and Jesus Christ before creation, where God says, I don't like animal sacrifices. They're not good enough. They don't work. You know, they were a temporary thing that had to be repeatedly offered. They were a poor, inadequate substitute that God really didn't like or accept. And Jesus steps up and says, I, I'm coming. I come to do your will. And so Jesus says, I will be that sacrifice. And so that, that's, a, that's an amazing thing. Now, and the other thing I want you to notice here, why do you think the, the blood of animals was unsatisfactory? And I'll submit to you that because the species is wrong. Jesus Christ was a homo sapien male, a human, modern human. And he died, he gave his life for the redemption of human beings, modern human beings, homo sapiens. Only a human could do that, but none of us could do it because we're tainted by the nature of sin. But he could do that, and he came to do God's will. So that's why a sacrifice was required, and that's why he had to be the sacrifice. The, the redemption of you and I was not finished on the cross. You know, Jesus on the cross uh, said, it is finished before he died. And uh, I, I've read in several sources that the, the Greek word is tetelestai, which means um, it, it was a uh, contraction that was used and stamped on, on a bill of sale that was paid in full. And so 
many say that the the interpretation how that would be understood in the first century would mean that that it was paid in full and in fact the blood had been shed at that moment i know there's there i've read disagreements about that too but i think the 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 message is is telling uh that when jesus shed his blood he you could arguably say that paid in full is the is a un, correct understanding of that verse because our redemption was not finished then. The blood had been sacrificed, but our redemption was not finished. Our redemption was not finished until Hebrews chapter 9 says that Jesus presented his blood before God the Father in heaven. So Christ has now become the high priest over all the good things that have come. He has entered the greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which was not made by human hands and is not part of the created world. With his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered into the most holy place once for all and secured our redemption forever. So Good Friday is really about the blood of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, and what that means to us. That should be our meditation this week. And I want to leave you with one final point because I think it's an important one. A, actually, a seminary professor uh, uh, approached me and, and said, uh, well, you know, uh, you know that that the medical understanding really is n not relevant because because of this verse because um, you know Jesus chose when he would die and he chose when he would resurrect and quoting this verse if we look at John chapter ten this is where Jesus talks about uh, the good shepherd and uh, that that leaves the ninety nine to search for the one and then he he talks about himself he says this is why the Father loves me because I lay down my life so that I may take it back again. No one takes it away from me, but I lay it down of my own free will. I have the authority to lay it down, and I have the authority to take it back again. This commandment I've received from my Father. And so that that uh, professor said, well, we'll see there. Jesus could lay his life down and take it back again. So he chose when he died, and he chose when he would resurrect. And I would just say to you that I, in my view is that that's a, 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 a erroneous overreading of that of what that verse means. It is true, of course, that Jesus had the freedom of will to lay down his life, or not. Um, but once he made the commitment, you know, he prayed in the garden, he's sweating blood. He says, if, if you can let this blood, this cup pass from me, please do. But nevertheless, not my will, but your be done. And so when Jesus made that commitment to the will of God and finishing the will of God, that started the irreversible process that led to his, his uh, crucifixion. And I will leave you with a supporting verse of that idea. Uh, I never understood this verse for years. I struggled with it. I couldn't understand what it meant. During his earthly life, Christ offered both requests and supplications with loud cries and tears this is the garden, right? To the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard. Do you think God the Father heard Jesus' prayer? Of course he did. Because of his devotion, although he was a son, he learned obedience through the things he suffered, and being perfected in this way, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. I could never understand, how did Jesus become perfect? Wasn't he perfect already? What I don't understand that. What does it mean? But here's what it means, or what I think the, the correct understanding here, and it correlates with the John chapter 10 verse, that God heard his prayer. When Jesus is praying, you know, can you let this cup pass? God heard that. Jesus could have walked away. He had the power to take his life back. He didn't have to do it. But he committed himself to obedience, and through the obedience he became perfect, perfected as our high priest and gave us eternal salvation by entering into the holy place, uh, as we talked about in Hebrews chapter 9. So, key takeaways, the gospel accounts of Jesus' death are consistent with modern medical knowledge. That's intrinsic evidence of their authenticity. Uh, Jesus died of traumatic hemorrhagic shock. And finally, Jesus Christ, as a homo sapien male, shed his blood to provide forgiveness for all modern humans. As our high priest, he presented his blood before God the Father in heaven, and his blood speaks for our mercy and forgiveness today.
So I will leave you there, and uh, I will stay for questions as long as people want to. <laughs>